cares about the money as you do with the loose. <laughs> so, I'm John Cade, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, uh, September 7th. Um, isn't that a famous day? Isn't that a day that lives in infamy or something? Eh, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 2019. Um, this show may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, but uh, we do have conversations and sometimes start conversations. Uh, we don't do Buffalo speeches and we don't do prayers. We talk politics and survival and uh, culture, arts, uh, and identity. And we still step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We will take on the false narratives and we'll provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us and we do it all right here from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk native. But first, let me remind people that our show does stream live audio at www.letstalknative.com. Uh, we stream live video of the show on our Facebook uh, group page and then that group page is shared through other group pages uh, via Facebook Live. We take the audio and we put it up on SoundCloud and that puts it up as a podcast on all of your favorite podcast platforms. And we take the video and we put it up on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And that way you'll catch all of our shows. And on YouTube in particular, you'll catch not only uh, the shows that we do here and in New York, but uh, our short form videos, which we are long overdue in producing another one. I promise we will be getting on that shortly. Um, but anyway, I, I want to introduce myself. I am the show's host and producer, and I'm joined in studio by Jake Proud, who is managing our video and our sound. And uh, I do have another topic, as always, something interesting to talk about here. And it, I've got to, I'm just going to say it, but then I got to explain that this is not a contradiction. A lot of times people think that, that racism is all about identifying the other and and then looking down upon the other. You know, racism has a couple of different characteristics to it. Sometimes not identifying the other is racist, and that's what I'm talking about here. The refusal to acknowledge our distinction and acknowledge our identity. When people say, oh, I don't see race, oh, I don't see color. Well, that means you don't even see who I am. You don't see, I mean, it's fine to say you don't see race or skin color and that kind of stuff, that, that'd be fine. But if, if in doing so, you're saying, I don't see any distinction. I don't, I don't see your, your, uh, your culture. I don't see anything about your history. You know, I'm going to pretend that we are all the same. See, that sameness is also racist. Because by dismissing our distinction, you're saying that, that, that I mean, you're essentially, and this is the problem we have with guys like Andrew Cuomo and, you know, and, and Congress and, and judges and all. The problem is, they don't want to acknowledge that we are different. And I'm not saying better. I mean, again, the, the problem, what racism is about is superiority. It's about feeling that you, are, uh, that you are above somebody else and that somebody else is beneath you. It isn't just about hating somebody. I mean, look, if you own slaves and you can just go on and talk about, oh, yeah, we own slaves, but we treat them nice. I'm sorry, you're still a racist because you or you think you have the right to own another human being. I, I get into this conversation with uh, with folks over the mascot issue. I say, oh, yeah, but we're we're respectful. Yeah, yeah, we're we call ourselves the Redskins, um, but we don't mean anything bad by it. Well, sorry, that's racist. <laughs> if you think you can appropriate somebody else's culture, and you say, oh, but we do it respectfully. Well, in your opinion, you do. And if you so, if that's the attitude that you have. I'm sorry, that puts you in the racist category. So if Andrew Cuomo wants to treat us as if we are not anybody distinct, that, that somehow we are, you know, I'm referring to, there's no place in law that can say that happened. When did that happen, that, that, that we became Americans, full-fledged Americans, that we became part of Mark Charles' famous, oh, we need to be we the people. And the reason people say that is because some of our own people, like Mark Charles, they they are essentially they essentially feed racism. No, he doesn't think he's superior, except for the fact that he's half Dutch. Maybe he does. But see, there are many Native people who think that if we maintain distinction, that means that we are primitive. That means that we are lower. 
that the only way that we lift ourselves up is to be an American. Man, that, that just supports the whole racist ideals about that superior, that, that being superior. That's what the whole assimilation thing is about. It's, it's putting away all those things. Kill the Indian, save the man, right? That's what it's about. Thomas Jefferson, he says, oh, yeah, if, if, if they become, you know, uh, among us and they, and they become uh, citizens of the United States, yeah, their history is done. They're done. But they're going to be happy with us. Because they will have, like we will have risen to their level. Because apparently as native people, we're, we're lower than everybody else. See, while that's not true, the, the notion that, that um, politicians, the governor, the president, you know, judges, congressmen, senators, whoever, that they can look at us and say, no, we don't see that you're, you're distinct. I'm Justin Trudeau's dad, Pierre Trudeau. Somebody just posted on Facebook this week about how he said, well, if you don't speak your language, you don't practice your culture, you can't claim to be native. See, they say you can't even claim it because you've assimilated. See, that's what the whole termination era thing was all about. That's, this is a whole, this all is all a plan. But if we don't, if one thing, if we don't fight for our distinction, and sometimes that is the crux of our, our of our survival fight. Look, we're all going to take the take a breath the next day. They're not, you know, they're not slaughtering us and then pull, putting us in a ditch to, uh, to, to mass graves anymore. They're not doing that. They don't have to. See, now what they can just say is, you simply don't exist. You don't exist as a, as a native person. Oh yeah, yeah, like I'm Irish and he's Italian. Yeah, like that. Yeah, you exist like that. But other than that, you're no different than me. You're just a different kind of immigrant. You're just part of that diverse mosaic of Americanism. No, no, we weren't one of your citizens. We, we weren't included in the U.S. Constitution. Our lands are distinct. And the fact that, you, that so many don't want to acknowledge that, that's racist. Because, in other words, there are people who feel like they are in the, in the position, that they are empowered, that they are superior enough to look at us and say, you're nothing different. You're not distinct. I mean, <clears throat> they'll, they'll use words, oh, you're not special. Look, not saying we're special. Whatever special means, I guess. But to say that we're not distinct. Look, part of what we, we talk about, you know, when people use words like sovereignty and, and autonomy and self-governance, is that we have the right to do that. We have the right... <clears throat> to not include ourselves and not subject ourselves to the United States. And there's never been any process that said, okay, you are hereby a subject of the United States. You are, citizenship has been imposed upon you. Now, look, I know they did that thing in 1924 where they declared that we we're all citizens, but that doesn't mean anything. They de can't declare it. I mean, we didn't consent to it. Now, there are plenty of people who are consenting like hell to, for it. But see, that's the issue. I think it's really important that people understand that racism isn't just about physical abuse. Racism isn't just about, it isn't really even just about abuse. It's about superiority, inferiority. It's that relationship between two people that are being defined differently by race. And if you can say, Oh no, we're all, you know, that's why I did that Tanzina Vega um interview a couple of years ago um on on NPR. Because you know, she was trying again trying to say, "Oh, yeah, but we're all Americans. We all identify ourselves differently, but we're all Americans." No. <laughs> no. We don't all. We don't all identify ourselves as Americans. Now, we get into this into this whole thing about well, like, well, who, who, who speaks for Native people? I mean, I get into this debate with, with, with folks on the mascot issue all the time. They'll say, uh, well, most Native people are fine with the Washington Redskins. Yeah, but who are, who are you calling Native people? And who are you to determine what Native people think as, uh, in a majority or minority or, or, or overall? Of course, it's always a white person who says that. And so when they'll say, well, such and such, she's native. Well, 
let's delve into that. Is she really? I, and I'm, this isn't about being Indianer than somebody else, but but if, if this is somebody whose you know grandmother was a Cherokee princess, yeah, okay, we've heard that one. But if that's what you're telling me, I mean, I, I saw this one website. And this woman says, "Well, my mother was native, my father was white. He abused my mother. We grew up in an abusive household, and the way I'm honoring my mother is supporting the mascot issue." Well, that's not honoring your mother, and she obviously didn't teach you any culture. So, if your mother was native, I don't know what that means. If you don't. If you're not connected to a people, if you're not a part of a community, whether you live in a community or not, if you're not a part somehow connected to to native people, now you're 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 saying you're native like somebody says they're Irish or Italian or whatever else. You don't you're not from Ireland or Italy. You don't speak the language, you have nothing to do with the culture. You're an American who clings to some, you know, some special sauce that thinks <laughs> that makes you somehow Different from others, I guess, but but that doesn't mean that you're native. Look, and and we, it's amazing that you can't even get an accurate count on how many native people li- live um, within the, the the confines of the United States borders. Uh, you can hear some people say two million. I've heard some people say five million, and then I hear some people say that we represent two percent of the population, or that we represent. I mean, most of the numbers I that that seem to make sense to me are the ones where they say we're less than. One uh, one tenth of one percent. We're, we're we're seven tenths. I'm sorry, seven, te- seven tenths of one percent. I mean, and that's including people who aren't necessarily living on native lands, because that's the other thing they say. Well, seventy percent of the native population doesn't even live on native territories. Well, okay, yeah, there are a lot of people who live in cities and and that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that's their only home, their only residence, or what they claim to be residents. But when you have that discussion, I'm not saying you can't be native if you don't live on a native territory. But if you live so far removed from native territory and you have no connection to native people, you have no connection to a native government, you have no connection to a native co- uh, culture, you know, employment, anything else, <clears throat> then that starts to be a bit of a tough, uh, you know, a, a tough definition. Be- and the reason I bring this up is because there are those of us who do live on native territories. We live and breathe being a native person every single day. Not just when somebody says, hey, is there anybody native in the room? And then somebody says, oh, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who, who raise their kids as native kids, who raise their grandkids as native kids. I mean, that, I mean that like, uh, and again, I'm talking about myself here, but not exclusively myself. But I live in a community where, where everybody's raising their kids as native kids. And it's distinct. And they are different. I'm not saying they're better or worse. And I'm not even saying that our culture is better or worse. There are certainly, uh, I think, I, I have a preference. But that's my preference. That, that's not me, you know, trying to create some empirical measurement about our culture being better or our people being better. But when the, the system, the outside system, the, the system that is controlled where, where racism is, is a part of that system can, can take the attitude. No, we're not going to recognize you. I'm, and we've literally heard people. I've, I've heard state officials, law enforcement, say, second you step off your territory, you're you know, different than anybody else. Well, wait a minute. I stop being, my identity disappears when I walk off my territory. Really? How is that even possible? And of course they're talking about how they feel they can treat us. You know, so whether it's, what they think is some huge advantage we have by living on native territory. And I think there's some advantages, but there's also some tremendous disadvantages. I wouldn't have it any other way, but that's just the way it is. But the idea that somebody like Andrew Cuomo will, uh, you know, hit, hit a guy like Eric white for, you know, a couple million bucks in, in, in a penalty for, for distrib- for, for shipping a native product from one native territory to another native territory, because He's not recognizing that we have the right for native to native trade. He's not recognizing that we have something distinct about our territories. On one hand, on the other hand, they're, they're quick to say, yeah, but was he going to a reservation? Again, something they wanted to find, not what we get to define, something they wanted to find. This subject matter is something, you know, I, I, and I got to give credit to this. I mean, Ross John, friend of mine, guy sits on council, he's, you know, uh, uh, you know, supporter of the show. Ross is the one who's, who's always tried to make this argument that 
the racism that we experience isn't just about putting us down. It's about the refusal to recognize that. And it's not even about treaties. I know some people always say, oh, treaty, this, treaty, that, treaty. But there, I mean, there's those. But the fact that we predate the very white population that, that now wants to say, we don't have to recognize your sovereignty. We don't have to recognize your right to do this or do that. Now, I'm not talking about the average American citizen. Look, we, we have thriving businesses on our territories that, uh, and, and we have a lot of allies within the U.S. You know, citizen population. We don't have a whole lot of allies in law enforcement or in the judicial system or in, in governance. Yeah, we have some people who blow smoke up our ass, but we don't have people who, who are really allies, who are really prepared. I mean, look, we've got people like, the, like this clown running for president. Oh, we need to be part of we the people. This is a guy who, who's a racist. Yeah, I mean, I know he, he's half native, he's half, half white, but he's a racist if he thinks that, that we need to fight for our right to full assimilation into the, into the United States. Of course, we weren't included in the U.S. Constitution. Why would we be? We were, we, we were, and I argue, are still a distinct people. So, of course, we wouldn't be included. I mean, he, he, make, he, he gives a whole speech and you know, says, oh, this is the, about the doctrine of discovery. Look, regardless of whether they have some religious dogma that, think that, that white people thought entitled them to take our lands or whatever else or, or, or dismiss us, that's the very thing that he's doing. He is a... He is promoting the doctrine of discovery by saying that we shouldn't be that we shouldn't exist as distinct people. We should be living as we the people, because somehow there are those that people that believe that if if we aren't Americans, that we are something less. That's racism. That's the superiority inferiority thing that I'm always talking about here. But see, this conversation doesn't happen uh, many times, and and I've heard Ross try to have this conversation and I can see people's eyes gloss over they, they don't get it. So I'm hoping by having this conversation and trying to explain it a little bit, maybe in a few different ways that people will, will un understand what I'm saying. But again, if you're one of those people who try to say, well, I don't see, I don't see race. I've got, I've got a black friend. Yeah. But do you understand that he's different than you? Do you understand that there's, that there's distinction? I'm not talking about whether he's an American or not. Whether he, whether he deserves civil rights, that's not the point. The point is he has a intergenerational um, uh, experience that goes back to slavery. Even if he didn't come, his ancestors didn't come as a slave, they all got lumped into the, you know Jim Crow and all that stuff. So if you're going to say you don't see him any different as anybody else, that's a problem. You think you're being, you know, oh, I'm, I'm being an anti-racist. No, you're not. And again, it's not enough to say that you're not a racist. And uh, somebody else has been talking about this a, a lot. I've, I've heard a few people, though. It's not enough to say that you're not a racist. If you're not an anti-racist, and, and again, when I'm talking about race, I mean the idea of promoting, if, if you're not actively working against this notion of superiority, and if you're among those people who say, who can look at somebody and say, well, I don't see you as any different, then that then you're then that's expressing some superiority because you think you have the power to do that. Like I said, I know this kind of doesn't fit within what most people understand as racism. And racism isn't just about not liking somebody because they're different. Sometimes refusing to acknowledge that somebody is is, is different is racist too. That's our experience. I mean, Look, going back to Thomas Jefferson's time, he, he assumed that if he created the right conditions with people, he could make Native people make a choice to either leave or they would be removed, which is what he advocated, or they would hang around enough that their distinction would disappear and that they wouldn't have to recognize it anymore. That is also a way of making people go extinct. So, and, and this plays out, this plays out not only with our, us trying to, you know, struggle for um, our right to do commerce in a, in a distinct way. This 
we go through this fight every time we stand in front of a, of a white man who believes he has authority, whether it's a, a judge or, or a white woman, <laughs> a judge or you know, a, a cop. And it doesn't even matter if they're white. If they are, if they are tools of that system that have racism embedded in it, and they all do, governance, you know, uh, policing, law enforcement, judicial, it, it all is laced with racism. If they can't understand, I mean, this isn't just about empathy, but if they can't understand that what brings us to the place where we're facing off, for whatever reason, maybe it's over the, the conflict on the throughway, maybe it's over the, the conflict over, you know, gaming revenue, maybe it's over a domestic violence or, you know, or, or whatever, missing murder of indigenous women. But if you don't understand that we have a distinct history, and I'm not talking about an ugly history. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, people, they think we get into a conversation. If you're going to teach Native history, you got to teach about massacres. No, that's, that's the American history. We have a history that goes way, way before that, that, that never being taught. But the history of our interaction between Native people and Europeans, Americans in particular, yeah, that's ugly history. And it does need to be taught. But it also needs to be taught in such a way that people realize that m many of those conflicts are still unresolved. Look, the United States has been trying to make us disappear, either through massacres, you know, executions, starvation, you know, uh, living in, in these, you know, impoverished, you know, uh, adverse conditions, or... I mean, and they've actively done this. That you know, or they've tried to make it disappear by by assimilation. That's what the residential schools. Over a hundred years, those things existed. We had there were policies, the relocation policies. This is the idea of taking native people off the reservation, setting up on a house and a job in the city, trying to cut that tie between native people and uh, and 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 their families and their and their communities. They they tried to kill our language. Oh, yeah, they used it for the code talking thing. But <laughs> notice that in spite of all the code talker stuff, it's not like there was a big effort to uh, resurgence immediately after World War I. So you know what? That language is very valuable. That language should be taught. Hell no. And those code talkers, they didn't even get acknowledged for another 30 or 30 years afterwards. Now everybody says, oh, that was such a brave, those, uh, those code talkers, they were heroes. They, they won the war. Well, I don't know. Look, they were exploited. And that's a, that's a sad story. It's not, it's not a, hero, a tale, tale of heroism. I'm not saying they weren't brave. But to be utilized in that way is just, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible tragedy. But, but again, even there, you know, even, even a code talker was treated differently. Not just because they had the language, not just because they had the code. Because they could be, they could be killed. They could be killed. They get under friendly fire. They could be killed by by an American soldier rather than risk them getting uh, getting captured. Nobody else had that distinction. So, now I'm not saying you know this this expendable ness is something is the distinction that I'm that I'm hoping that we uh, we can you know uh, get acknowledged. <clears throat> but the fact that we are a distinct people or peoples, because let, let's be clear, we're not all the same either. And I think. The idea of creating this this pan Indianism, you know, like like, like what mascots do, you know, like what Hollywood has done. Look, we fell into it too. I, you know, I've talked about it before. You can find pictures of of from the you know the fifties and the sixties, even the seventies, of uh, Haudenosaunee, um, Longhouse people, um, Six Nations, people wearing wearing a, a Plains Indian headdress. Why? Because because we lost that sense of identity too. Something that we have reclaimed. I mean, I hear people say on the mascot issue, for the, well, Native people never, they, they didn't even speak out against this for, for, for over all these years. Well, some did. But we've also gained a bit of a voice and we've gained, we've gained a certain amount of our identity back. Stuff that was stripped away by U.S. policy in this attempt to diminish our distinction. So for many of us, more than anything else, our fight for survival is a, is a fight for acknowledgement 
about that distinction. I'm not talking about federal recognition or state recognition as a, as a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States. No, just the opposite. I'm saying that we need to be acknowledged for people who are, may not be distinct or, or may not be subordinate to the laws of the United States. See, that's the tough, that's the difficult part. I mean, you go back to the, to the 1920s. This is exactly what, what uh, New York, um, other states, but, but there, you know, there's, there's a whole thing going on between the New York State Indian Commission and the Federal Indian Commission. And these are not Native people necessarily. These, these are state agencies and federal you know, agencies or committees, commissions, that were supposed to try to sort out the mess that, that existed in the United States in the 1920s with Native people still existing as distinct, pe- distinct people. How do, we, how do we solve this thing? Well, that's why in 1924 they passed the, the Indian Citizenship Act. They said, well, we're just going to make them all citizens. And then they'll just disappear. They'll just fade into the woodwork. Ah, they'll intermarry. It's funny. And if you don't believe that's, that's part of the, the policy, if you go to some of the records, and there are, there are records on this thing about sterilization programs, you know who, who was sterilized and who wasn't? Uh, of course, we're talking about women because it was much easier for these um, IHS and these residential schools to abuse women because it's what they always did, um, you know, before the, the Catholic Church got all gay and started uh, uh, abusing little boys. But the, the, the women who were, who were sterilized mostly were the quote-unquote full bloods. Now, why would that be? Why not, uh, why not sterilize the, uh, the half-breeds, as they call them? Well, their view was they're already on the path towards assimilation. I mean, uh, from a bloodline standpoint. But if we've got people in our custody who are full-bloods, then there's obviously been some resistance to intermingling. Those are the ones we don't want breeding. If, if, somebody's, if somebody's already half white, or, or better yet, maybe three-quarters white, and we don't need to sterilize them because the likelihood is their next, their, their next child is going to be even less native than them from a blood quantum standpoint. See, that's the other thing, blood quantum. That's the other, that's the other you know, trick. The other trick is, is to convince native people that they can eliminate their own po- uh, uh, population by saying, okay, uh, you're only half native now. And if you drop below this certain level, and if you're not the right half, then we can eliminate you. So we can get native people to do some of the, uh, some of the very elimination that the federal government was trying to do for all these years. Hey, where's the bottom of the hour? So uh, we'll, we'll take a break and we'll go out with some music and come on, uh, come on back. I'm not done yet. I gotta, I gotta check my notes here and see what I left out on this, but no, this is an important deal and, and people need to understand this and they have to understand that again, that racism has many other, other faces to it. And this is just one of them. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. We'll be right back after this. to somebody let them know talk to your friends let your feelings show even if it feels like there's nobody don't let go sometimes it feels like the walls are closing in Sometimes it feels like You'll never fit in You know lots of people love you Don't let go Even if you think No one cares about you Please remember there's something you can do Not by yourself, I know that much is true 
reach out your hand There'll be someone there for you Just reach out You try to be brave Pretend there's nothing wrong But you need a little help, child To make you feel strong You know, lots of people love you So don't let go Lots of people love you Don't let go All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Um, look, that's that's Murray Porter with his song that is dedicated towards um, the suicide crisis. But the but the words work for the very thing that I'm talking about here. Don't let go. Don't let go about who you are, your identity. We, I mean, again, this is part of our struggle. So when I say at the top of the show that I'm going to talk about survival, this is a survival issue. I mean, look, we. And, we can do a whole show on survival, um, but this is one of them. All right, hey, before I get back get back into it too much, uh, let me acknowledge my my sponsors. I want to thank Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses, uh, Eric White and ERW Enterprises, a um, couple of uh, anonymous uh, supporters of the show. I I, I I still acknowledge you, even I don't if I don't shout your name out, but uh, you know who you are, so uh, so I appreciate it. And of course, I I I always have to do this on occasion anyway. Um, we are in our tenth year the 10th year of this program. And look, it, the staying power is easy because my, my expectations are, are pretty low. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, get a, a, a million views or whatever else. I know there are people out there to, who need to hear some of this conversation. Why? Because they think these things. They think these things, but they never hear it materialize in a conversation. So part of this is to advance a conversation or start a conversation. But I couldn't have been doing this thing for 10 years if I didn't have people along the way who, who supported the program, uh, who may not be you know, financially supporting it now. And they support sometimes by just listening to the show. Uh, you know, and you know, I run into somebody and they'll say, hey, I, I heard your show about this and I, I appreciate you talking about this thing. Look, all that stuff helps. I don't need a cheering squad necessarily, but it, it does help to know that if something I talked about in this program helped somebody in a, in a conversation, then that, that's a positive thing. But again, I couldn't be I couldn't be in my 10th year of doing this program if I didn't have a lot of help along the way. Some some of you guys, hey, I'd love to, I'd love to have you come back and support the program even financially. We you know, we're we're always trying to improve the product, we're trying to improve our our you know, our facility here and uh you know, the more support we get, the better we can do that. But I also need to acknowledge those people who's uh, you know, who support the show by sharing programs. Whether you share the podcast or the YouTube videos, or in my, like with my wife who, who shares the uh, Facebook live stream on, on so many other group pages. Those of you who listen to the show and then share this thing on your pages or on, your, on other group pages, that's, that's what helps get the word out. This subject that I'm talking about here, I've never done a show on this one before. I've talked a lot about racism, but I've never talked about this. And, and, you, know, and you know, shame on me because this is a conversation that I've had many times, but again, Ross John is the only guy that I've had this conversation with about how much, how much racism we experience from the outside based solely on their refusal to acknowledge who we are. And, I'm, we're, and we're not talking about them putting us up on a pedestal or thinking that we have, the, that we have all of these rights that no other human being has. That's not the issue. The issue is that we have not given up certain rights. And of course, uh, you know, like my, my friend uh, Degarundega says all the time, we can't talk about rights without responsibilities. See, that's the other thing about the idea of trying to create a welfare state. See, one of the ways you can strip somebody of their, of their rights is by stripping away their responsibilities or, or asserting that, that somehow we have we failed in our responsibilities. And I'm not saying there hasn't been some failures along the way. So when we're talking about survival, 
survival when it comes to maintaining our distinction and our identity is important but survival is also about picking up those uh, those responsibilities that we may have laid down so i mean some of this comes back on us but i i want to be clear here i've heard native people say well we can't claim to be sovereign if we're getting federal funds or state funds well wait a second do you realize first first off that that problem or that you know that fails on so many levels. There are countries all over the world who rely on funding from the United States. Israel, for instance, is the one that always comes to mind. Nobody ever challenges whether Israel has, you know, is, is a sovereign nation. Well, I mean, there are enemies of Israel that do, but the allies of Israel never say that, in spite of how much money goes into that, you know, I- I- into that country. Both governmental money, I mean, you know, I mean, mon- funds from the U.S. Treasury, but also funds that go to, go to Israel from from a very successful business class of, of of American Jewish people who who support Israel financially. But there there are countries all over the world that uh, that receive funds, and nobody ever says that their sovereignty doesn't exist. So, and 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 here's the other thing: those countries receiving all those funds, the, the United States has no debt to them. They certainly have a debt to native people and they certainly have a debt to black people for you know you know for you know hundreds of years of slavery um including 150 years of slavery uh the united or, or more than that i guess that the united states wasn't responsible for Re- look the united states was solely responsible for the continuation of the slave industry when other countries were backing away from it including great britain again i said it before Part of the reason the Revolutionary War, War was fought, the, the fight for independence, that was the white people wanted, wanted to fight for their independent right to have slaves and take native lands. So it is really important that, that whoever you are, that you don't allow, and when people call the United States this melting pot, you know, if, if it's a melting pot, that means that it all it, it, the, the distinction goes away that you somehow become this homogenized mass of humanity. On one hand, people saw the time, oh, we, 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 we love diversity. No, you don't. If your idea of diversity is to include people who are different than you, than you to make them the same, then, then, then you don't love diversity. You love assimilation. You love the idea of melting us all together and, and, and stirring up the pot so there's no distinction whatsoever. There is no American culture. I mean, there are, there are policies, uh, you know, the United States has, has developed over, over a couple hundred years of its, of its, its existence. But there, there is no distinct culture. I mean, and, and when you want to, you know, what about jazz? Well, that's not an American thing. I mean, if you want to talk about the arts, or even science and technology. I mean, the nuclear bomb came, you know, came from, you know, Einstein and, and, and other immigrants. It didn't come from, you know, good old fashioned American know-how, nor did the space, uh, the space race. That was another German, Dr. Irvin von Braun, that, that led the way with, with all of that. So, you know, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with, with, with that kind of um, inclusion with people when it comes to, to science. But you'll note, and I was just listening to a program today that talked about the, um, uh, the anatomy or, or uh, you know, this, this idea um, of studying science. Not, not science as a field of study, but a field of study that studies the uh, anthropology of science. Because science is a man thing, right? So you can't, if you're going to study man, you should study how man looks at science. And science is very Euro, Eurocentric. And there, and there, are, and there are such clear biases associated with it. I mean, uh, you know, the Bering Strait theory, there you go. Or this notion, and, and this is what was said specifically on the, on the program, this notion of the old world and the new world. Old compared to, who says it's old? And who says, uh, who decides what's new and what's old? 
Native people have lived here on this continent for a long, long time before white people started calling it the New World and referring to the Old World as theirs. Like somehow what that part of the planet was older than this part of the planet? Oh, come on. These are the, the, these biases that exist in the study of, you know, in all the, the sciences. Psychology, uh, anthropology, archaeology, I mean, all of it. But it is, again, it, it is so important that as we talk about being native, that there has to be something to that. It's not just about a bloodline. It's not just about whether you, you have native blood in you. I, I, it is, I mean, that's, that's something, but I mean, this is about DNA. This is about culture. This is about knowing your history, knowing your language if you can. But even knowing the language, look, we, we had our language fully intact when we, when we were being completely overrun uh, by this, this cultural oppression. And when I say cultural oppression, it's not like the American culture, because I guess there was no such thing. It's that ours was being obliterated. Again, Thomas Jefferson, you know, and, and the founding fathers of the United States. I mean, even, you know, again, even the king of England, his hope was to subjugate Native people without, you know, without having to, you know, have a, this massive war, having no idea how many Native people there really were because they, they hadn't got, barely gotten, you know, a quarter of the way across the, uh, across the continent yet. But his whole, whole idea was, was, you know, again, to embrace the difference between King George and Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson says, we need to um, cultivate their love. We don't have to love them, but we need to make them love us. For him, it was all a game. It was all a ruse. It was all, it was all pretend. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll offer them stuff. We'll, 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 we'll sell them stuff really cheap and we'll get them in debt to us. They have a... They, they don't know our, the, the, the stuff that we have. We have more stuff to trade them. And, and what do they have? They've got land that we want. So we'll, we'll, we'll get them in debt. And then they'll lop off that debt with their land. And once we have them surrounded, they'll just disappear. They'll either head off on their own. Or they'll just, they're, they'll, they're going to they're gonna see our way of life and want it. And you know what? He was right. There are a lot of native people. Even, I mean, like I said, I've mentioned that, that um, letter, or that statement from uh, Pierre Trudeau about native people, you know, if they don't know their language and they don't practice their culture, that they have no right to claim. You would think that would have sent shockwaves. You know how many native people just, you know, fell in love with Justin Trudeau when he ran for, or became the prime minister? Do you know how many people on the U.S. and the Canadian side totally embrace this notion of being Canadian or American. Like I said, I drive down the territory here, Cattaraugus. There are certain households that I'm going to see American flags all over the yards. I won't see a Seneca flag. And uh, again, when you, you go to the administration building, you go to the, even in front of the bingo hall, there it is, the Seneca Nation flag and the American flag flying side by side. As if that's somehow some smooth relationship. I don't know what that what that represents when you when you see an American flag flying at a at a at a nation business or a, or a nation building I should say. I'm mean, gonna get I I get an American flag flying at the at the you know American Legion. I mean these these are people who who gave sometimes their blood fighting you know in an American uniform for right or wrong they, they, you know so I get that. But the fire hall, you know the administration building. The roundabout down, you know, down at the end in Irving. I mean, why? Why is the, the American flag so, I mean, the, the, our community centers? Why, why? The bingo hall? I'll tell you why. It, it, it Again, it, it gets back to this notion that, that we have accepted a certain level of this inferiority complex that, uh, you know, that was the assumption they had, that they were superior to us. I think for... You know, for centuries, Native people said, "We, in fact, we looked at at, at white people 
as the people that hadn't developed. Our word for them spoke of them not as being mentally retarded or, you know, but just a human being. I mean, almost looking at their skin color. So, yeah, you can tell they're not done yet. They're, they haven't they haven't gotten any color yet. <laughs> yeah, so there was this whole notion that we looked at white people as, as people who weren't fully developed. They had strange behaviors to them. They d- didn't seem to be very physically fit, very healthy. And then they had a lot of, you know, a lot of developmental problems. So that's what we that's that's how we viewed white people, not necessarily as a as a negative, but as a, as a people that oh we can help we can help bring them along. But see, white people just thought they, were, they automatically thought that they were superior. And as time would go on, I mean, some of the bizarre things that they that they tried to indoctrinate us into believing, like Christianity. I mean, how is that that story any different than than fairy tales that are talked about? I mean, Noah and the Ark? I mean, come on. I mean, magically making fish and bread appear to, to feed the masses? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, some of the stuff is bizarre. I mean, you know, rising from the dead, the whole bit. <clears throat> but anyway, but our people, bought, not only did our people buy into that, many people took our culture and they tried to line it right up with some of their belief systems. Oh, so, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, your culture is kind of like ours because with this, this, and this. No, it's not. I mean, look at the, the gun the weed, this story. That sounds to sound that starts to sound just like Jesus Christ. So much so that there's a fairly significant segment of, of you know some of this population, even around here, that think the gun the weed was Jesus Christ. I mean, that's how much we have indoctrinated some of the, the thinking. And and these are the long some of the long house people who believe that some of the the handsome lake the the uh, dirty wheel people who believe that. Now, the the people who are authorities on the subject claim that's not true, but there is an awful lot of people running around who who, uh, who want to believe that. The guy right across the street believes that. <laughs> he goes on to say, "Oh yeah, see the doctrine of Christian discovery shouldn't apply to us because we were Christians first because of the on the weed." I mean, the, look, this stuff is said, folks. I'm not just making this stuff up. But when I, but I have talked about this before, and it fits right in with this conversation. And this is when I talk about the sense of inferiority. <clears throat> look at the 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 highly paid professionals that represent the Seneca Nation as their their you know their uh, you know president of operations with the uh, with with the gaming operation, the CEO or or, or Whoever runs the, the casino, whatever the title is, white person, lawyers, lobbyists, consultants, PR experts, all these people who are fashioning Seneca Nation policy. And I'm not picking on Seneca Nation. This is just where I live. You can go to any native territory. Some of the most influential people in every native territory is a white man with a law degree. And, and of course, the native people with a law degree aren't any better because they've been, they've been indoctrinated into that, in that whole belief system. They believe in constitutional law. Rule of law is, is, is the crux to an advanced civilization. Well, how the hell did we live for thousands of years without this domineering sense and of hierarchy associated with, with the white man's rule of law? What, what we, it was just a coincidence. No, there, there are other things more important than, than rule of law, and it has to do with with understanding hu- humanness and our relationship as human beings on the planet. That essentially is is a higher level of understanding. Now, I'm not trying to create a hierarchy because that's a that's mental capacity. That's not that's not you know a racial designation. Many of our people, many people who are much more higher blood quantum than me have fallen, have lost that. But this is what we need to bring back. We need to understand that, that our role here as, as native people is first as a very social group that we are, that's, you know, just like other parts of creation have very strong societies. I mean, wolves come to mind. Birds, obviously. I mean, look at you know, look at how you know geese fly or starlings flock. I mean, there's a sense for the relationship with each other, not just 
you know the the distance the physical relationship but i mean the, the, and we as native people we, uh, human beings in general but see when you start you know separating people by class and by race the society that does that and i'm not talking about the acknowledgement of, of of us as 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 the distinct people because what happens is they bring you in and then they separate you. See, when I say the United States won't recognize our, our distinction, that's only for a very specific purpose. They're still going to look at native people as, as the, as the lower, uh, lowest rung of, of American society. They just want to make, make sure they can get rid of the label, sovereignty, self-governance, all that stuff. But it's important that we, and I, and I talk about community all the time, it's important that we understand that, that our identity is not one that exists as individuals. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but our identities are shaped by our, our society, our culture. If we aren't interacting with each other as a community and, and, and having that relationship be bound by the culture that our ancestors, you know, I mean, we're standing on, 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 on the, on the paths where we're walking in the footsteps of people, millions of millions of people came before us. And we, and we've deviated so far from that path. You know, we, we live in, you know, McMansions or we, you know, we, we, look, the fact that we don't live in longhouses anymore is, is, is one thing. But the fact that we've lost such a sense of community, that's another thing. I mean, look, we've had powers that be for years who have said, well, our territories are just where we live. We have to work out there. We have no economy here. I mean, there are places like Onondaga who actually said, no, there should be no economy in Onondaga. I mean, I've, I've talked to people out there who said, no, we don't want business here. Then then how the hell do you plan to live? Oh, well, we, well, we work out there. So we'll sell our label, labor to the white man. And when they give us some money, we'll spend it there and we'll bring the stuff back that we work for back to here and, and, that, and we'll consume it. So, I mean, and that is, that is a mentality that went on for, for generations. See, many of us realize that that was wrong. But we, we haven't been able to completely clear the way, clear, get, find the path again. So that's the struggle. And when we look at ourselves as inferior, because that's the way they look at it. Says, look, if you're, not, if you're not one of us, then, you know, we're just, we're just not going to acknowledge your distinction. You know, and so they're either going to try to force that upon us and then we become convinced ourselves that, that we are inferior. Like I said, look on our territories. Some of the highest paying jobs on our territories, and I'm not talking about, you know, I know people can get into, you know, political corruption and all that other stuff, and I'm not, not even going there. I'm just saying, you go to any native territory, and some of the highest paid people are white people. I mean, we, we don't think that our own people are capable of developing, I mean, this many years, I'm look, well, I granted, I understand that many of us, you know, in most, many territories, it's first generation business people. The Seneca Nation has been, been running gaming operations for over 15 years now. In 15 years, some of those senior positions couldn't be, can't be taken over? In 15 years of this high level of finance, we can't have, you know, we, we still are relying on white people to tell us how to run our businesses. And I'm that, and look, this is private sector too that I'm talking about here. A few years back, they hired just over conversations over the possibility of the Seneca Nation opening a school. They paid some guy some ungodly um, salary to be their head, their schoolmaster, their, their headmaster, I think they called him. Didn't do a goddamn thing. They never built, built a school, but they paid that white man a bunch of money. Because apparently, even though we've educated our kids in some form or another, 
for thousands of years, we need to have a white guy tell us how to do it. See, that's, that's our own imposed sense of inferiority. This is where we actually feed into this notion. And what we do is we, we convince ourselves the only way to advance is to be more like them. And of course, once we become more and more like them, then they get then they get to say, "Well, we don't have to acknowledge your distinction anymore." It's I mean, this is I, again. I know this sounds crazy. I mean, this is almost a, a circular argument in a way. But all of this stuff comes back to that same place that we have to maintain that a level of distinction. Some level of it. Now, look, can we, get, can we get everything back all at once? No. But like I said, in the 50s, there were Native people running around with, with Plains Indian headdresses on, calling themselves chiefs. The, the pictures of, uh, of the Haudenosaunee declaring war on the Axis powers in World War II. Haudenosaunee chiefs go to Washington and, and sign a declaration of war against the Axis power. They, didn't, they weren't wearing gustoas, folks. So we've gotten better. We have learned. Look, there are people, I mean, and I don't, I'm not disrespecting those guys. I'm just saying that that's the level, of, even as those guys were trying to maintain some distinction, you could tell we had already had some of this adverse effect of what Hollywood and, you know, writers, authors, American authors, you know, Longfellow, I mean, all these people who, who just went on and on about redefining who we were. And then we buy into that. We have, we have had a strong resurgence in language. And in that language, it isn't a military code. It's a code to understanding who we are. Because that language comes from a place long ago. So by delving into that language, understanding the etymology of words and why a phrase means something, it tells us what our ancestors were thinking when they developed that language. That is some of the, the, the keenest insight. So again, learning the language, learning to speak language is important, but understanding where it comes from, not just why a word, that, that a, mer, uh, a word means something or that a phrase means something, but why a phrase or a word means something. That's some keen insight into, who, in, into where we came from. Now, is everything that we ever... <clears throat> held onto in the past something that we need to bring forward no we were an evolving people all the time we 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 discarded certain things and we might have thrown a few babies out with the bath water along the way we certainly have in the last couple hundred years but i think delving into that stuff and understanding a little bit more <clears throat> about what made us successful what made us distinct what 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 gave us our high quality of life because more than anything else, if you compare life before Europeans came and life after Europeans came, I think it would be pretty hard to suggest, even with nicer houses and cars and ATVs, bigger bellies, I think we could argue that we have not experienced a higher quality of life. We have more social problems. We have more mental illness, substance abuse, suicide. <clears throat> you know, runaways, missing and murdered indigenous women, you know, domestic violence. We, we top a lot of those lists. And if you top those lists, you can't suggest that the quality of your life, even if it's, even if somebody threw money at it, even if you, I mean, look, look at their culture. Some of the wealthiest people in, in, in the United States, you know, have had all kinds of, you know, mental problems, psychological problems, suicide drug abuse, overdoses. <clears throat> we look at some of the most creative minds that, uh, you know, in, in the arts and music. And what a, what a tragedy their lives were. Yeah, they, they, they were artistic, but they weren't happy. <clears throat> Part of the desire to maintain distinction is to, is to follow our culture to a higher quality of life. 
to follow our culture in the pursuit of happiness. That's really what we need to do. All right. Well, again, you know, thank you. Thank you for listening. I see a bunch of people joined up. Uh, or, uh, we're following us here on Facebook. Um, share the show. I, this is a conversation that more people need to know and, and have. So share, share the show. I greatly appreciate it. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. You know it.